So I just, uh, I've got a couple of announcements my, of my own, um, so uh, bear with me over here. Uh, the good news is, is that Adam is on his way back, uh, not literally, but uh, he's going to be arriving at the end of, uh, of April, so that's in about a month's time. And um, so the, the brother is going to be here for about three months, and so he's looking for like a, a, a granny flat kind of bachelor pad kind of thing for about three months. So if, know of, of something that can work for, for him, um, come and speak to me or Bryce or Ben afterwards, we love to I kind of like hook him up in-house, eh? it would be nice to hook him up in-house, so he doesn't have to land here and kind of like look for accommodation on his own, yeah? Yeah? yeah. <laughs> okay. And then, um, then uh, like a couple of other two dates is that um, on the 11th of April, uh, we wanting to give the Churis a, a kind of a gift that we I've been speaking it from the pulpit before um, uh, about a gift that we want to give the Churis and so that's going to be presented on the 11th of April and so that would be a pretty good Sunday to, to pull in obviously with, within the restrictions but um, just wanted to put out there that's an amazing gift it's going to be really really cool and then on the 2nd of May we, we're going to have a, a kind of a farewell the juries and the idea is that you're going to have a church here and then we're going to gather up at the bride pits on the reserve and we're just going to give them a good old South African bride before they fly out to the States. They're going to be flying out the next Sunday, believe it or not. And so um, Bryce is going to give his final um, teaching on, in the pulpit on, on, um, on Sunday the 9th. So uh, those dates are, are important to, to hold on to. Um, and I think I have covered everything. Yeah, yeah. Everest, you did the Good Friday and Easter and all of that, so that's great. Good job. So we find ourselves in, in Acts, so, so page uh, with me to Acts chapter 14. And we've been, uh, I made the mistake the other day, I was so bold, uh, I, was, uh, I was covering uh, chapter 13, and I was like, we are halfway through the book of Acts. And I'm like, oh, it's got 28 chapters. <laughs> Um, and it's been a really, really cool journey, hasn't it? Has it not? You can agree with me. You can. Alright. Um, I don't know about you, but uh, as a little bit of an introduction, I really love um, incredible stories of bravery. Alright? I don't know if you've watched um, uh, the Band of Brothers, that series, the Band of Brothers. Have you watched it? Of the 51st um, uh, Airborne Division that kind of fly in um, the day before Normandy. And they drop onto the French um, shores. Oh man, it is an incredible series. Go and get it. I'm not getting paid for anything, but it's a really cool, cool series. But uh, I've got three stories for you this morning. Uh, two short ones, and then one that we're going to open up, which is incredible. All right. Um, but the first one, uh, I don't know if you. Let me just get it quickly because I'm going to need it. You guys know the explorer um, Ernest Shackleton? Have you heard of him? He's the guy that um, he, there was a race to get to the um, it was the race to get to the South Pole, right? And I can't remember who'd been in there, but he was gutted. So he was like, no, I'm not gonna just get to the South Pole. I'm gonna cross the whole southern what's it, Antarctica. I'm gonna across Antarctica. So listen to this this incredible story. So Shackleton had wanted to discover the South Pole but was beaten to that this um, this to that distinction. Instead, he decided to be the first man to cross the continent of Antarctica by boat, which was possible to be done during the Antarctic summer. Unfortunately, the crew of Shackleton's Endurance, which was the ship, ran out of summer, <laughs> and their ship became permanently frozen in the polar ice. Though the crew was able to wait out most of the winter, the Endurance didn't. She sank, leaving the crew stranded on the ice floe. To make matters worse, the ship had drifted 1,200 miles off course while stranded. Shackleton packed his crew into three lifeboats as the ice under them began to melt and got them to safely, safe, safely to Elephant Island. Although Elephant Island was solid ground, it was still uninhabited and far from traders. They were pretty much stranded with no food. Shackleton loaded four of the most ne necessary crew into an open-air lifeboat and set off for a whaling station 800 miles away. So they were, they were heading to South Georgia. 
He refused to pack for more than four weeks, saying that if the journey took longer, they would die anyway. <laughs> the boat reached South Georgia, but it landed on the opposite side of the island, where the, where the whaling station was not. So listen to this. And the water was too dangerous, so Shackleton took two of his men and made a 56-hour hike over the snowy mountain range to the whaling station on the other side. And from there, he organized the rescue of all of his men without a single fatality. Can you just like, give you a little bit of goosebumps? You know what I mean? It's like incredible endurance, right? The, the last one is this Henry Irwin, right? This guy is, this guy is a soldier. <laughs> It really was. So anyways, the radio operator bought a B-29 Super Fortress in the Asia Pacific Theater, which was like that um, World War II uh, around Japan. And so during the 1945 um, bombing mission over Kurivama in Japan, um, a white phosphorus bomb, which they were letting out just to let everyone know when they, where they were, they prematurely ignited in the aircraft in the in the kind of the tube and so basically this phosphorus bomb was like exploding inside the tube and what happens with phosphorus apparently it's so hot it's like white hot it can melt metal right and so as this, the smoke of this thing just came back up the tube and filled the whole plane it's busy going now and they're over the pacific anyway so in an in a, in a amazing act of bravery he picks up the bomb right in his bare hands. Well, he probably had gloves, but he had. And he, and he carries the, the, the bomb across the plane. Apparently, the captain remembers, he says, it's his pot and knee sir. And the guy looks at it like this, and they open up the window, and he chucks the bomb out. By the time he had got there, it had like burnt his whole face and his chest, his arms, and he fell just to the floor. And, and the rest of the crew, they thankfully could pull out of the dive and get back to him. They landed in the plane. The guy apparently had was just like, white in the face, right? Not the guy that had carried the bomb, they took my, Apparently it took like almost a year for recovery, but the guy lived through it, right? You should check him out. Er, Erwin, um, uh, Henry Irwin, incredible story of bravery, right? And we love these stories because they, they just like, they help us to endure, right? Or if this guy could do this, or, or I mean, that was a short-lived thing. I mean, well, it took him a long time to recover, sorry. But it was short-lived. I mean, for Shackleton, they, it was like days, you know, of, of endurance. But um, we're going to look at this incredible story of Paul and Barnabas. Because they've been going through some gnarly adventures, right? They're going through Cyprus. They don't have any, any um, uh, new believers until they get to Paphos. And they like have to battle this wizard bar Jesus. And then they get um, to, to Turkey, at the bottom of Turkey. And then they go up to Pisidia. And then they go up to Antioch of uh, Pisidia. And then uh, they are pretty, pretty much kicked out of the town, right? They're just persecuted and kicked out of the town. And now they're going to get to the city of Iconium. So let's read it together. And it's not going to get easier. I just lost my hand. We're still there? Oh, here we are. So read with me as we read the first seven verses and I'm going to pray for us. At Iconium, they entered together into the Jewish synagogue and spoke in such a way that a great number of both Jews and Greeks believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. So they remained for a long time, speaking boldly for the Lord, who bore witness to the word of His grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. But the people of the city were divided. Some sided with the Jews and some with the Apostles. When an attempt was made by both Gentiles and Jews with their rulers to mistreat them and to stone them, they learnt of it and fled to Lystra and Derbe, cities of Lyconia, and to the surrounding country. And there they continued to preach the Gospel. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you so much for your word this morning. We thank you that we can continue in your word, Lord. We thank you that we live in a country that it is, it is safe to proclaim these truths, Lord. And God, we want to pray for spiritual discernment this morning. We want to pray for the mind of Christ to be come into our, us this morning, God. 
I want to pray that you would be lifted up, that your word would be lifted up, and that you would illuminate it to our minds. And help me, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Cool. So in Iconium is about 130 kilometers southeast of Antioch, so they're kind of like moving a bit down through Turkey towards the, the yeah, southeast of the eastern side. Yeah, they have to think about that for a moment. And they go to the local um, synagogue, which is kind of practice for Paul and Barnabas, and they say that they spoke in such a way that a great number was believed. And you're like, woohoo, finally a little bit of success on their trip, right? But the next verse tells us immediately that, uh, that some of the Jews, the unbelieving Jews, had stirred up um, and, and started to, to divide the, the whole city. Right? And so you would, you would go like, oh man, why, why, why do they, when they immediately they get success, are they dealt with such a, like a, a somebody comes along and they kind of breaks up what they've been, um, uh, they've been building. And so the problem is, is that it's not just kind of like, oh, they're just believing um, Christians. And now all of a sudden, it's personal, right? It gets personal. These unbelieving Jews actually poison the minds against the brothers. So we, this is against Paul and Barnabas. And so I don't know about you, but uh, if you've uh, maybe had some dealings with some people, and, and, and it's fine if in business where something goes wrong, you've built, worked hard with it, and, and it fails. But when it gets personal, it gets serious. It, would you agree with me? It gets a little bit serious. And, so, and, and, and also for Paul and Barnabas, they choose. Right? And then these are brothers that they've gone out to kind of reach out to. And, and yet they, 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 these are the guys that are fighting against them, that are actually turning others um, against Paul and Barnabas. And so basically this is a repeat of what happened in Antioch. And is it going to be a repeat every, on all of Paul's mission journeys? There's going to be these Judaizers that are going to rise up and they're going to turn people against Paul. And it's going to be something that they just kind of have to do. But the incredible thing is, is that Paul and Barnabas don't go home. They carry on, right? And so um, they, they decide actually to say, I'm going to stay here. I'm going to stay a long time. Verse, um, verse 3 tells us, so they remain for a long time. It's really hard here, but we're going to remain for a long time. Come on now, that's amazing. And so they, they, they hang out there because the new believers in this persecuting environment need to obviously be built up, right? And so they hang out there for a long time until they get word that uh, the, the, the city has actually decided they're going to they're gonna stone them, right? And so then they, they leave and they go into Lysonia, which is uh, near Lystra and Derby, and they, they settle in the town of Lystra, right? Um, what, I, what I forgot to actually me mention over here is that it, it actually says when they stay there for a long time, it says they spoke boldly for the Lord who bore witness to the word of His grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. And so this word of grace can be transferred, uh, translated into the gospel, right? They continue to speak boldly the gospel, right? The word of truth. And so the cool thing in that order is as they spoke the word of truth, God bore witness with signs and wonders. And that's a cool order to remember, right? Because it wasn't signs and wonders bore witness to the truth. It was the truth that bore witness to, sign, uh, to the signs and wonders. Um, <clears throat> and so the cool thing is we can remember with Christ's uh, ministry is that Christ had thousands of people following him, most of his ministry. But who were the ones that continued the ministry? Twelve that had received the word of truth, right? Twelve that he had discipled, right? And it's amazing. They saw plenty of signs and wonders. But did they stand with Jesus? And today we have Palm Sunday, right? And we're going to have a bit of our own Palm Sunday in this story too. But there were, there were many people lining up the streets wanting to, to make him king, right? That was Palm Sunday. What happened on Good Friday? From make him king, crucify him. Right? And so signs and wonders aren't necessarily, um, you know, um, the, the, the kind of the concluding evidence of your salvation, you know, or, or it doesn't necessarily lead to salvation. So anyway, so they, they go into Lystra and um, they just, they, they continue. And, and 
I, 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 don't, I don't know if you, you realize in this piece is that they, they weren't very popular while they did this thing. <laughs> they, they had half of the, 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 the city that really loved them and half the city that hated them, right? But they just kept on going. And, and I don't know if you've been following some of uh, the Christian media, but we've got friends called Andres and Koya. Um, they own a, um, a wedding venue out in Stanford called The Loftables. And um, they've, uh, it's an amazing testimony. So they, um, they were approached by a couple from the, the GLBT um, community and asked them if they could get married. And so being Christian and, and they believed that God had given this venue for them, um, for the glory of God, declined to marry them, right? Um, feeling that it was against their convictions and, God had, and, and God's given the, the, the marriage between a man and a wife, right? It didn't make them popular. So the, the South African Human Rights um, Commission dragged them to court, right? And uh, anyway, there was, some, uh, there was a court case going on. They continued. They didn't succumb. They didn't say, this is, okay, we'll just change our convictions, right? They just continued. And it's an amazing encouragement when we hear these stories. We hear Shackleton, we hear this urban guy, we hear of Paul, and, and, and it's encouraging to us because we think often, and we want people to like us, like um, Bryce said the other day, we want people to like us when we say the exclusivity of Christ. You know, Christ is the only way to eternal love. And like the world says no, and they don't like us, and they divide people, right? But it, it's an encouragement for us to continue. And so we get into the second piece of this um, text, and we're going to read down into um, chat, verse 18 together. This is when it's going to get excited. Now at Lystra, there was a man sitting who could not use his feet. He was crippled from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul speaking and Paul looking intently at him, seeing that he had faith to be made well, said in a loud voice, Stand upright on your feet. And he, they sprung up and began walking. And when the crowd saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in Lyconium, the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. Paul and uh, Barnabas they called Zeus and Paul Hermes because he was the chief speaker. And the priest of Zeus whose temple was at the entrance of the city brought oxen and garlands to the gates and wanted to offer sacrifice with the crowds. But when the apostles and Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they tore their garments and rushed out into the crowd, crying out, Men, why are you doing these things? Why we are also we also are men of like nature with you, and we bring you good news that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made the heavens and the earth and the, the sea and all that is in them. In past generations he allowed all the nations to walk in their own ways. Yet he did not leave himself without witness, for he did good by giving you rains from heaven, fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. But even with these words, they scarcely restrained the people from offering sacrifice to them. Alright, so to kind of understand the situation, they're actually going even more rural now into Galatia. So Lystra, Derby, and the Laconian area is kind of like heavy rural. Apparently it's like in between mountain ranges and there's like this plateau that kind of opens up. Never been in Turkey, so I could never tell you that. But um, Paul and Bottom, they actually, we're gonna, we find out in this text, they, they speak Laconian. So um, it's like they don't, I, I don't know, I've been to the Sutu before on a missions trip and, and you can go to these where their huts are and you, you talk to some of the guys that broken English and then they're, you know, they, 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 they speak Sutu there and then you can't understand anything. So it's kind of like that kind of whole situation, right? And so they, there's no synagogue as well. So apparently the rule was if there was 10 mature um, uh, Jewish men in a the town, they would have a synagogue, right? And so there's clearly not a lot of Jews here, which is probably a good thing at this moment in time in their missions. But they get, um, they get there and uh, so they, they start preaching on the streets, right? They start talking. And as Paul is speaking um, to a couple, maybe some people come together and he's, he's seeing this, this lame guy, he's paralyzed in his legs and he's just sitting against the wall and we find out that he's paralyzed from birth, right? He obviously didn't know that maybe, right? 
when you're speaking, but, but afterwards when he speaks to the guy, he finds out. And so Paul sees in this guy's eyes something is going on in this guy. There's faith that's building up. And it's so cool. It's, the, the truth is being spoken and, and faith starts to be built in this guy. And it's the same thing in our lives. When we receive truth, faith is built. Faith comes from hearing and hearing comes from the Word of God. It's built up. And what happens? This, he, he sees this faith build up and he, and he shouts out this guy, Stand up on your feet. Stand upright. And this guy jumps up because he's ready. He jumps up. And, um, and it's so beautiful analogy for us. We come in here sometimes crippled and broken. And we, what do we do? We hear the Word of God we get built up and we leave less crippled than we are before. But what happens is, is that this whole town erupts in Lyconium and they are shouting at the top of their voices, the gods have come down, right? The gods have gone up. And I forgot to mention that they're predominantly a Greek society. So they've been ruled by the Roman world, but they have held their Greek kind of um, understanding and their Greek gods. And we all know kind of some of the Greek gods, uh, the gods of Hercules and and uh, what's it, some of them, um, yeah, Hermes and, and uh, Zeus, but they said the gods have come down. And apparently there's a legend in this area that um, they used to tell us that, that Her uh, Hercules, Hermes and Zeus had previously came down, right? Legend. Um, and they were looking for accommodation. Fancy that, when your god comes down, he's, he didn't, he didn't <laughs> organize accommodation. Anyway, he's knocking down. I shouldn't actually mock that because when Jesus came, he didn't know. <laughs> anyway, so they, he's looking for a moment, they're not. So they're just like, sorry, there's no place for you, right? Until this old couple takes them in, right? And gives them just like a morsels of whatever they poor. And, and um, anyway, so they, they find out this is Hermes and, and Zeus, right? And Hermes blesses and makes them um, priests of God, and they, they make their little, their little um, uh, house into a temple for Zeus, right? And when they die, they become these huge trees that kind of guard the temple, right? And so when they see this miracle performed in front of them, they're like, "We don't want them to go away. You know, we don't want the same thing to happen again, right?" And so. Um, so, unawares of this, they're shouting out in the Lyconian, um, you know, the gods are here. And so, they call the, the priest of Zeus out and he's bringing these oxen, these garlands, these big uh, kind of like wreaths that they'll like, start putting over Zeus and, and Hermes, you know, kind of like honoring them. They're going to have this big sacrifice. And it suddenly clicks for Paul and Barnabas. And they are like, this is sacrifice. You cannot worship us. And so they run into the crowd and they are begging them. They're saying, please don't do this. Right? Paul is pleading with them. He says, we bring you good news. He says, we are like nature. Um, that you should turn from these vain things, which is idolatry, idols, things that, to the thing that is that, to the living God who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and, and, and all that is in them. And in past generations, he allowed all nations to walk in their ways. Yet he did not leave himself without witness. For he did good by giving you rains and heaven and, and fruitful seeds, and satisfying your hearts with food. And so he's appealing to them in creation, right? Because they have no realization of God. He appeals to them what they know of creation. And God's actually been good to you. He appeals to them that God is creator. God is their provider. Right? And God is merciful because you've been, you've been worshipping these vain things. And, and so, um, what is going on here is the question we want to know. Right? These Lyconians are idol worshippers. Right? What, what do we know from Psalms 115? What happens to idol worshippers is that they become like their idols. Right? They become blind. They become deaf. They become mute. They become given like unable to walk. Right? Uh, unable to do anything right, of any value. So the Lyconians, in, in Psalm 115, it says, in verse um, 4 to 8, it says, their, their idols are silver and gold, the work of human hands. They have mouths, but do not speak. Eyes, but do not see. They have ears, but do not hear. Noses, but do not smell. They have hands, but they do not feel. Feet, but they cannot walk. And the 
they do not make a sound in their throat. And then verse 8 says, those who make them become like them, so do all who trust in them. So what Paul is, um, oh, there's, there's this crazy story in India, right? These um, Indian priests, about, uh, I think there's 50 of these Indian priests are moving this massive statue of Buddha, right? Uh, down a river to a new location, right? And while the, the this, this, this um, statue is on this barge, right? Um, the, 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 the statue starts to start teeter over and starts slipping, right? And it's going to fall into the water. And so 10 of these guys start picking up the statue and trying to keep it up. And 10 of the men eventually the statue falls over, breaks the barge, drowns um, 10 of these priests, right? And it's such a sad thing because they're moving the statue. They can't move itself, right? <laughs> it can't swim, right? And it, and it goes, and, and, and when we worship idols, it sinks our boats, right? It takes us down. That's the, that's the story of, the, of, of that story. Right? Um, and so <clears throat> what happens is, is that these people, when they hear of God, when they hear God proclaimed to them as being creator or protector and merciful, it doesn't fit into their idol mind. It doesn't, right? And the world is exactly like that. It's like we idolize money, we idolize power. And so when we hear of, of you know, God is providing, we think of money, right? And, and then we think God is going to have to fit into my idea of money, right? Or we hear of, you know, God is our protector, you know, and, and, and it kind of just doesn't fit into our, our mentality of the world, right? And so, and, and a big thing lately is, is this, this whole thing of, of self, right? We worship ourselves. The world is like, you've got to love yourself more. Come on, man. You've got to just like give yourself a little bit more love, you know? And where is that in Scripture in, in many ways? Right? God's, what God's calling us to deny self, and we'll see that in Paul right now, actually. Um, but there, there's this idol which, and then even in Christianity, we have idols as well. Teachers, and worship leaders, and, and all of these things, and it's subtle, but it, 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 it slows down our, and, and, and it becomes, it makes us, it makes God small. It makes God, like, we cut God into our size, and, and, and we, we limit God into these things. And, and idols make God small and it limits our worship of God. And these guys just couldn't. And I don't know if you remember in, in uh, the story of the Israelites when Moses went up the mountain, right? And they made that carved image. That was the first story of idolatry. And they, they had still kept their gods or their, their mentality of gods from Egypt, right? And so when God had split the Red Sea, all the plagues that had brought them out, showing them how great he was, protected them for 24 hours before the sea split, right? And yet, at a, at a moment when Moses was there, were worshipping a, 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 um, a golden image, right? They, this God, they, it was still limited to them. It limits them. And so, we, this, for, for the Lyconians, La they, they, they were limited. God couldn't fit into their box, right? And so, can you imagine if Paul and Barnabas, Paul and Barnabas obviously run into the crowd and say, we're just men, we're just like you, right? Can you imagine if they said to each other, let's just leave this thing for a moment. <laughs> let's just take this thing. <laughs> we'll let them uh, worship us. And then we'll tell them about Jesus, right? And I thought to myself, man, that's sometimes a lot what happens in this world. And like sometimes I go, I'm, I'm like, Hey man, have you listened to this guy teach? Have you listened to this guy? Have you have you you got to listen to this guy? You know this guy has got it. I thought to myself, man, that's idol worship, right? It's subtle, right? It's subtle, but it's, it's like going, you come to this guy and he's going to tell you about Jesus. You know what I mean? And meanwhile, we've got Jesus right here in the pages of this book. Every time we open it up, you know, and so amazingly they. they they, they try, but, and uh, if you imagine, they, they could have just enjoyed it for a while, but as soon as the guys come from Antioch, and you see in, um, in the following verses of verse 19, because um, people are fickle, right? And, uh, and let's just read what happens to them. <clears throat> verse 19. 
But Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having persuaded the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. But when the disciples gathered around him, he rose up and entered the city on the next day. And on the next day, he went on with Barnabas to do. When they had preached the gospel to the city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra, to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church, with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. Right? And so the important thing to see here is that these people didn't want to listen to the truth of God, right? They didn't want to hear the word of God. And what happened when men came and persuaded them? It was so easy for them just to be persuaded. I just thought to myself, you know, like sometimes we take the wisdom of men and we think that is solid and good. And then as soon as someone else, like they enter these, these, these uh, jealous, um, Jew, unbelieving Jews from Antioch, do they just come in? They easily persuade these guys. Easily persuade them. Right? And I just thought, this book is rock solid because this is the Word of God. And it, it, what, if we trust and put our faith in it, we won't be persuaded. And so, these guys come in and, and they, they drag, or they, they get Paul and they stone him. Right? And it's one of those moments um, where, where it's kind of like, what the heck is going on here? It's like going, this, we were on a mission trip, and we wanted to come and spread the good news, right? And all of a sudden, Barnabas is like faced with his best buddy at this moment, being stunned. They, they, they think they've killed, and many, I read a lot, many people think he was dead, right? Drag him out of the city, leave him there. Can you just imagine that? And, and I was just thinking, it's, 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 it's just like, this is a dark moment within this first missionary's journey. It's like, things were bad, but now it's totally bad. Paul is dead, you know. And, and the disciples get around them, those that didn't believe, and he stands up. And it's like, and I know it, it, it's a comical illustration, but it's, it's like that stay, that, that time in that Rocky Boa, Bo, Bo, what's it, Rocky movie, right? Uh, and, and, and he's down on the mat, and it's like, he's gone, it's over. And he stands up, and obviously what Rocky does is he beats the, out of the other man, and he, he wins the match, we remember that. And, and we get that, and we think, if this was a movie, he stands up, Barnabas and them like, get themselves some guns, and they're like, <clears throat> and they, they just make an end to these guys, right? And we would go like, that's justified. You know what I mean? We would. But, but it doesn't. What happens? It just says that, that he rose up and he went back into the city. And then the next day, he goes on. I just think it's so, it's so true. You know, this is such truth for us, right? We want to see a massive victory at this time, right? We want to see those guys hung and stoned, right? And what does Paul do? He just picks up his himself and he goes to the in back and he just carries on and, and and he got new strength and he just carries on going it's amazing and instead of fighting for his rights or defending himself to to uh, he just carries on he just goes on and so in verse 24 they they make more disciples right and now it's ending towards the end of the, the trip they that they need to start going back Verse 22, it says they returned to Lystra, they returned to Iconium and Antioch. Can you imagine returning to these places, right? Going back to Lystra, going back to Iconium, going back to Antioch, and strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. And so this is good gospel truth for us. This is like a, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. And um, 
Yeah, the truth is, is that the kingdom, to, the way into the kingdom of heaven is narrow and it's bumpy and it's through ditches, right? And there's this cool story of, of John Wesley, the famous, um, the famous uh, hymn writer. So the story is told about John Wesley, Wesley when he was young. Um, he met a village bully on this narrow road in their carriages, right? And the village bully knew John Wesley, right? And uh, they kind of like eyed up one of those kind of like, those, uh, what's it called? Uh, that kind of uh, showdown kind of thing, right? And, uh, and this guy was like, he just kept in the middle. And so gladly, you know, John Wesley pulled out into the ditch and he kind of just waited. The guy came out and as this bully came by, he says, I never turn away for fools. John Wesley shouts out, neither do I! You know? <laughs> and so the whole, the whole thing is, like, I'm not going to let this thing go down. I'm going to glad. I'm going to turn down into this ditch and I'm going to carry on, right? And so um, it works out that, like that um, for most of our lives. If God calls us where we are and where we are called to, we might be moms, we might be dads, <laughs> we might be businessmen, we might be doing many kind of things, and we get beaten up by this world. It's true. We get beaten up by this world. And um, we get knocked down, and, 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 and sometimes we feel like we're dead beat, man. We've just been stoned up there. But what does God do? He's so faithful with picking us up and giving us the strength to go on, right? And so in many ways, we might just go like, where is the victory in God? Like, I thought there was victory in this, in this thing. Like, where is the justice in this thing? Is this thing just the 99 rounds of me just getting beaten and beaten and beaten, you know? And, um, and where is the victory? How does God get glory when God's children are persecuted? And this is, a, this is a close thing to me in my, in my journey in life, right? Um, when, when, when Rena and I had our second child, Joe, uh, and when he was three months old, and old he was diagnosed with um, leukemia, right? And um, we, I remember just going like, we'll just get him onto some pills. And um, he'll be alright. We just find out this is going to be a long journey. And it's going to be like a minimum of years. And then we realize that this thing is long. And this is going to be my wife. She's in, in, in Tigerberg, in, in the oncology unit there. And I'm in Amaris. And we're just calling each other. And it's just like, she's in the, the fray. She's like battling it every now and then. And, and it's just like, she's like, when is this going to stop? You know, when is this thing? And, and, and Joe got like in remission and he's doing good. And we went on holiday and, we went, and God's sucking him. And he never recovered. In two, two years and three months he passed away. It was like, <laughs> felt like, felt like, like, <laughs> poor, like just like totally knocked down, knocked down. And, 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 and we like, in this way, we go, where is the glory in that? Where, where does God get glory in that? You know, like, and, and, and Paul speaks straight, and this was a verse for us, and I want to encourage you with this, because sometimes we feel like we just get mowed down by life. It just takes us out, you know. It's a bit of a long piece, we go, this, is, this speaks right into this piece. In 2 Corinthians 4, um, verse 8 to 12, it says, Even if our gospel is veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers. And this is, this is what happened in Lystra. And he kept them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Christ Jesus as Lord, with ourselves as your servants. For Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus. So this was busy what Paul was doing. He was living his life for Christ, for others, and so that others can come in. But we have this treasure in jars of clay, which is broken, to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. 
always, hear this, always carrying in the body, the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. And that's incredible. That is something that only Christ can do. Through our suffering, Christ is manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. And man, that is amazing. Because I think Paul could write that after his first mission journey because he's going to go to Corinth next. He's wrote that to the Corinth. Like, I died in Lystra. And the cool thing what happened to Lystra, the second time around, who does he pick up? Timothy. Timothy becomes his buddy. It's incredible. He died in Lystra for Timothy. And I just think we died. And so many times we, we, you know, we endure because, you know, we, we kind of like want to see victory, want to see victory. And the, the coolest thing that God revealed to me in this is that, is that this is how it works. We endure because Christ has already endured and conquered. We are victorious in our sufferings because his, of his victory, he was victorious on the cross. And that's why Paul and Barnabas tore their clothes at the thought of being worshipped. And that's why they went on with their journey. Because it's not about their victory or their glory, but it was about God's glory, right? And the life of Jesus manifested in our suffering lives. And, and it goes on to in the story of Joseph too, right? In, in Joseph, after the, the revealing of his brothers, that they like thrown him in a pit and sold him up in, in, in Genesis 50 verse 21, when they say, oh, you're going to kill us now that our dad is dead. You're going to obviously take revenge where he says, he says, no, what you plan for me, what you plan for evil, it says, this is the direct verse, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive to this day. And it was the truth. The, Israel, the Israelites were, were, were born in Egypt. And so we're going to finish up in these last couple of verses. Thanks for bearing with me. But then um, verse 24 says, And as they passed through Pisidia and came to Pamphylia, and when they had spoken the word in Perga, they went down to Attilia. And from there they sailed to Antioch, and when, where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work that they had fulfilled. And when they arrived and gathered the church together, they declared all that God had done for them. And how he had opened the doors of faith to the Gentiles. And there remained no little time with the disciples. And the cool thing that is that in this is that they, they declared all that God had done you know, with them. You know? And it's amazing. It's like they had done a lot. But it was like it was all God. It was all God. And, and I think that's the testimony in our lives too. It's like we persevere. And we push through for the glory of God. But like Paul says, it's like, I worked harder than all of the rest. It was not me that was working, it was God. Christ who was working on me and through me. Right? And so, and they strengthened the church. And that's the cool thing when you get missionaries back. You know, they get to stand up here and they go, Oh, I was beaten and I was not. <laughs> but, but they were here and they, but God was good. And we, 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 we preached the gospel here. And what happens in ours? We go, let's go. I also want to be a part of that. And I also want to be a part of these things. And so, in conclusion, Paul and Barnabas, um, they complete their first missionary journey, and it, and it isn't easy, and it, it was super testing, but the, the God sustained them and grew their, their faith in Him. And we should be greatly encouraged. And I was just thinking of that when we live for the glory of God, that Galatians 2 verse 20, that says that uh, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I that live, but Christ that lives in me. In the life that I now live, I live by faith, you know, in the one that has died for me. And it's so cool that this comes out as we get into Easter this week. This is, we should typically have our Easter Sunday. I mean, uh, not Easter Sunday, Palm Sunday, right? And that's the, 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 the thing with Paul and Barnabas, our own Palm Sunday today, is that they were hailed as heroes, Greek gods. And then the next day, they're stoned, right? Or Paul is stoned. And Jesus was the same. You know, Jesus came and, and uh, they wanted to make him king. And then on Good Friday, 
He's, he's hung on the cross for us and for our sins. And so, as we're going to get into this um, and go to the communion table, um, I want to encourage you, whatever God is like pinpointed in this message, and whatever is God has come out to you, take it before Him. Take it to the table and ask the Lord to do what He wants to do in our hearts around these things. And so, and I, I, I'd like to, as we worship, uh, um, maybe some of the leaders, I think it would be great, uh, Chris, if you could also, but I just thought, the cool thing, when, when Paul was dead, what happened? The disciples gathered around him. And I don't know, I presume they were praying. And it would be cool. I think it would be, it would be great. Um, and we, we, I'm going to be up here, and Chris is going to be up here. And, and, and during the worship time after communion, if you want to come up for prayer and your brothers pray for you, I think it would be great. Um, so let's, let's close in prayer. Father God, we, I thank you for your word this morning and these gospel truths that came out from this word, Lord. And we ask that you would make us steadfast, Lord, because it's hard in our lives, Lord. We go through struggle, difficult times, Lord Jesus, and, and there's illness, Lord Jesus, but there's also just partners that we struggle with, Lord, or there's, there's bosses, or there's financial, or there's economy, Lord Jesus, and, and Lord, we, we, we want to not look to the Bible, Lord, we don't even want to look to man, Lord Jesus, we want to look only to you, Jesus, for our strength. And God, so help us, Father God, as we do this, Lord, as we do this thing life, this thing called life, Lord. We, we need your strength. We need you to help us to just carry on, Lord. And so we ask for this now. And as we go to the table, Lord Jesus, we, we pray that we would, we would see that the victory is in you, Jesus. You've already conquered the grave. You've already made a, 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 a mortal um, kind of slaying of the enemy. He is about to be done for. And, and you've dealt with us, and Jesus. And so our lives, can, we can persevere because of you, Jesus. And so we, we thank you now. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.